From gaining muscle several times faster than normal, to growing without lifting at all, exercise science has discovered many things about muscle growth that you probably haven't heard about. Let's start with stretching. Did you know that static stretching could build just as much muscle as lifting? To date, two studies have directly compared lifting weights to stretching. In 2023, Wernicke and colleagues performed a groundbreaking study. They split the participants into two groups. The lifting group performed five sets of 10 to 12 reps on the calf raise, three days per week. The stretching group, on the other hand, stretched their calves in an orthosis for an hour a day at a discomfort rating of eight out of 10. Here's what Eric Helms, who tried the experiment for himself, had to say. We did see a significant increase in muscle thickness. That's all good and, and fun, but this was not good and fun. I, in fact, I'd say it was good as far as the outcome, but man, it was extremely painful. Uh, what I would experience would be like pins and needles and discomfort and trying, trying to jump out of my body about 20 minutes in and then going, sweet, third of the way there. Mm. And the beauty of it that you have to stay out of, out of an 8 out of 10 discomfort is that while it would get better if you just held the same distance, every time it started to get better, I had to then tighten the boot more. So it stayed this way for 12 weeks. It was incredibly painful. I got a little bit better at being tolerant of the pins and needles, but my calf would go numb and then it would just kind of burn everywhere. But it seemed to work. At the end of the six-week intervention, both groups had gained a similar amount of muscle in their calves. Just this year, the same group of researchers conducted another study, this time in the pecs. The lifting group performed five sets of 12 repetitions, three days per week. The stretching group stretched their pecs for 15 minutes per day, four days a week, at a discomfort rating of 10 out of 10. Yet again, both groups grew their pecs by a similar amount. So what gives? Well, it turns out that stretching can build just as much muscle as lifting weights. Over a dozen studies at this point have shown that stretching can be effective for building muscle. But there is a catch. You need to be stretching hard and for quite a long time. We also have dozens of animal stretching studies that have shown crazy muscle growth. In fact, this is where the idea of stretch-mediated hypertrophy stems from. You induce a crazy weighted stretch in animals and observe insane muscle growth. But why? When you stretch, your muscles generate passive tension, just like a resistance band being stretched out. And yeah, the amount of tension you're generating might not be that much, but if you stretch hard enough and for a long enough time, that tension can actually build up to the point of stimulating hypertrophy. I wouldn't recommend replacing lifting weights with stretching, but this theory can come in handy when traveling, for example. Training your quads, calves, pecs, and triceps without equipment is straightforward. But what about your hamstrings or your back? To minimize muscle loss, you could try stretching them hard for five to 15 minutes a few times a week. This can be brutal at first, so start by taking it easy. If you want some good stretches you can do anywhere, I showed you some of my favorite stretches over the last few minutes. What if I told you there was a way to multiply your muscle growth? Let me explain. When your muscle grows, individual muscle fibers are increasing in size. So if your fibers grow by 10% each, you've gained 10% more muscle. However, instead of making individual fibers grow bigger, what if I told you you could create new fibers altogether? That's what exercise scientists like Professor Kevin Muak refer to as muscle hyperplasia, and it's real. When we think about hyperplasia, we're thinking about the number of muscle fibers. So we're not talking about the growing of the existing number of muscle fibers that you have. Um, we're talking about adding entirely new muscle fibers to your muscle. So that's what we think about typically in the context of, of hyperplasia. And, you know, hyperplasia is a process that happens early during development. Um, in your muscles, you know, like there's primary and secondary myogenesis, there's a point at which you add a bunch of new muscle fibers, but then those muscle fibers, once they're there, uh, there comes a certain point where you're just making them grow and you're not adding new ones in order to make the whole muscle grow, right? In fact, there are animal studies where stretching and lifting both cause muscle hyperplasia. Several studies have also found that bodybuilders and athletes have more muscle fibers than untrained controls. Unfortunately, randomized controlled trials on the subject are hard to come by, since they require you to cut out a large chunk of muscle. As a result, even experts aren't sure as to whether muscle hyperplasia can even occur in adult humans from lifting. I'm sort of of the opinion that if it is happening in humans, it's usually in an extreme scenario 
um, I would think in a like response to like really intense resistance training, maybe intense resistance training that's supplemented by anabolic steroids. Um, and it's not a mechanism of growth that I think is probably common to most, uh, most conditions in humans. In contrast, it seems relatively clear that taking steroids can induce muscle hyperplasia, dramatically benefiting muscle growth. But how can we naturally activate muscle hyperplasia? Well, there are two hypotheses. The leading hypothesis is called fiber splitting. When a muscle fiber experiences a large degree of muscle damage, this can cause the fiber to split. One muscle fiber turns into two. The second hypothesis is the satellite cell hypothesis, which doesn't have as much evidence. Muscle cells have what are called satellite cells. As the name implies, these are cells that hang around your muscle cell and play various roles. Upon exercising, these satellite cells can fuse to create a new muscle fiber. In both of these scenarios, a large degree of muscle damage is what initiates this physiological phenomenon. While we have lots of research in various animals, we don't have perfect research in humans. Since most studies are observational, they simply look at differences in fiber numbers of different populations who either exercise or don't, we can't clearly say exercise can create new muscle fibers in adult humans. However, causing muscle damage seems to increase the chances of it occurring. That said, experts like Kevin aren't even convinced it's something you should chase. We're beginning to get more clarity on, on, on the prevalence of it and when it does happen um, through studies that involve muscle damage, because that seems to be mm -hmm. the instance where you get these things starting to occur, the appearance of new muscle fibers, but that's usually the product of like muscle damage and like a more of a sort of regenerative response to a muscle being severely damaged. Um, and whether or not that results in you having more muscle fibers that then lead to your muscle getting bigger and stronger, I think is probably not likely. That said, if you wanted to try to stimulate muscle hyperplasia, your best bet is probably to vary exercises every few months. This will increase muscle damage since your body isn't accustomed to the novel exercises. Eccentric only exercises and training closer to failure can also be good ideas in this regard. If you're looking for the most effective exercises, you'll want to check out Myodapt. Myodapt is the smartest training app on the market. It ranks exercises for you in terms of effectiveness based on the latest research. It's like having a coach in your pocket. In contrast to other apps on the market, it's science-based and generates truly individualized programs instead of relying on templates. Go to myodapp.com now and sign up for a lifetime discount upon launch. We're aiming for it to launch in December 2024. What if I told you your body had the ability to grow muscle up to four times faster? Let me explain. There are times when your body can rapidly lose muscle. For example, if you recently got into a car accident and had to undergo bed rest, muscle atrophy occurs very quickly. However, upon recovering and resuming regular exercise, your body has the ability to regain muscle very quickly. This is referred to as muscle memory. There are two definitions of muscle memory. The first refers to your body's ability to retain motor skills for a very, very long time. The skill of riding a bike, for example. The second definition refers to your muscle's ability to remember being bigger. So the thought process here is as the muscle grows, myonuclei get added to the muscle fiber, and that supports the growth. But then when you atrophy, so if you stop exercising, your muscle fibers get smaller, whatever the, uh, um, the case may be, uh, that you would maintain the nuclei that you kept or the nuclei that you gained the first time. So even though the muscle fiber got smaller, it would just have more nuclei in it. And the thought process is that when you go to retrain, that you wouldn't have to go through that whole process of adding nuclei again. You already added them, they're already there. And so then the muscle can kind of um, expand and grow again more quickly. A group of researchers in Japan conducted several studies on the concept of muscle memory. In their studies, they split participants into two groups, a continuous training group who trained consistently throughout the whole study and an intermittent training group who trained for a few weeks and then took some time off. As you'd expect, during their time off, participants in the intermittent training group lost muscle. However, upon resuming training, they gained muscle up to four times faster than the continuous training group. 
This is clear evidence for the concept of muscle memory. But how does muscle memory work? Why can we regain muscle so much faster? There are two schools of thought. To explain, visualize a muscle fiber as a cylinder that has thousands of little factories called myonuclei, where muscle growth occurs. These myonuclei contain the blueprints to enable faster muscle growth. The myonuclear domain theory states that each individual myonucleus can only oversee so much muscle real estate. So, to keep the fiber growing, new myonuclei need to be added. The addition of myonuclei can present a bottleneck to the muscle growth process. If you don't add new myonuclei, the muscle fiber can't keep growing. When you lift weights, stem cells around the muscle are activated. These stem cells fuse and contribute a new myonucleus to the muscle fiber, allowing it to keep growing. Let's say you got injured and had to stop training. While the muscle fiber would shrink and get smaller, myonuclei, which contain the blueprints for growing muscle, stay around for months to years. Since these myonuclei stick around, they serve as a catalyst for regrowing lost muscle much faster. That's the myonuclear domain theory in a nutshell. There is a second hypothesis though, epigenetic modifications to existing myonuclei. So we all have essentially the same set of genes, um, but how they get controlled and accessed and expressed can change based on the different layers of control above the DNA. So things like DNA methylation or histone modifications or all these things that are related to more the, the structural component of how DNA is organized. That can be modified, then allows genes to be expressed in different ways. And so the thought process with epigenetics is that you may epigenetically change the nuclei that you have so that when you go to exercise again after a long layoff, that the genes that were important for growth the first time are easier to access and can cause you to grow again more quickly when you start retraining. Instead of adding new myonuclei, epigenetic modifications are about improving the blueprints inside your myonuclei. In all likelihood, both of these are actually happening side by side, contributing to your muscle's ability to regrow. Muscle memory is a godsend. Life happens, you get injured, demotivated, or you get sick. You lose muscle. Your body has your back. Get back into working out and you'll quickly reach your prior physique around two to four times faster than how long it took you to build up that muscle in the first place. Muscle memory also has implications for exercising and health. If you exercised earlier into your life, but then stop exercising for years or potentially even decades, you may still see benefits of having exercised earlier in life. You may have heard that bodybuilders are big, but it's all fluff and pump. The muscle fibers are just swollen up, but not functional. You may even have heard terms like sarcoplasmic and myofibrillar hypertrophy floating around. Let's review what those terms mean. Your muscle fibers are composed of a variety of structures. You have the sarcoplasm, which is composed of proteins, water, organelles, and a variety of other non-contractile elements. For your muscle fibers to actually be able to contract, your muscle fibers also contain myofibrils. These are the contractile units of your fibers. When someone speaks about sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, they are referring to an increase in the size of the muscle fiber where the ratio of sarcoplasm to myofibril has increased. Conversely, if someone speaks of myofibrillar hypertrophy, they are referring to an increase in the size of the muscle fiber where the ratio of sarcoplasm to myofibril has remained the same or decreased. Since sarcoplasmic hypertrophy refers to a relative increase in the non-contractile parts of the muscle fiber, it's often deemed non-functional. Your muscle fiber's ability to produce force decreases when scaled to its size. That's why you'll often hear people say, bodybuilders have big muscles, but it's all fluff. Effectively, they're saying their muscles are big, but relatively weaker. Myofibrillar hypertrophy, on the other hand, means an increase in the contractile elements of a muscle fiber. So it's usually thought of as functional. Your muscle fiber's ability to produce force stays the same or actually increases relative to its size. The classic stereotype is that powerlifters have smaller muscles than bodybuilders, but they have more myofibrillar hypertrophy, making them strong, but small. Importantly, that functional, non-functional dichotomy isn't true. While sarcoplasmic growth doesn't directly grow the part of the muscle fiber that produces force, it does make the muscle fiber more efficient at creating ATP for muscle contraction. It is still functional, just functional in a different way. 
Are these ideas even real? Simply put, yes. We have studies showing sarcoplasmic hypertrophy occurring from lifting. What's unclear is whether there's a limit to sarcoplasmic hypertrophy or not. Some studies suggest that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy occurs more readily in individuals who haven't experienced much of it yet. In fact, most studies find that increases in muscle size are just myofibrillar hypertrophy, not sarcoplasmic. Many questions remain about sarcoplasmic versus myofibrillar hypertrophy. However, both can occur, and in the future, we may find out that certain types of training are better at stimulating sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, allowing us to see even more muscle growth if we focus on that type of training. Or, alternatively, if you're a strength athlete, you could avoid doing that type of training to be as strong as possible in a given weight class. You may have heard certain influencers speak about the theory of stretch mediated hypertrophy and about longitudinal hypertrophy. The idea that when stretching or training a muscle at long muscle lengths, sarcomeres get added in series to your muscle fiber. They claim, however, that this type of muscle growth is short-lived and only occurs in complete beginners. What does that mean? Your muscle fibers are composed of myofibrils, which you can think of as long cylinders. These cylinders are made up of sarcomeres, which are the functional units of muscle. In turn, sarcomeres are composed of actin and myosin, allowing your muscles to contract. The idea of stretch mediated hypertrophy is that when stretching or training at lower muscle lengths, the sarcomere will experience passive tension. Upon experiencing passive tension, individual sarcomeres will grow, increasing in length. Eventually, because of how long individual sarcomeres have gotten, your body will instead opt to add more sarcomeres, since lengthening existing ones even more isn't feasible. Because you are increasing the length of the muscle fiber, this has been referred to as longitudinal hypertrophy. In contrast, there is another type of hypertrophy that's been referred to as radial hypertrophy, which involves adding sarcomeres not following one another, but in parallel to one another. These two types of hypertrophy are relatively well documented. Some influencers will claim that longer muscle length training is only effective in beginners. The idea goes that only so many sarcomeres can be added in series. Once you hit that cap, there's no longer any benefit to longer muscle length training. That idea is probably false. My colleagues and I performed a systematic review of all studies that examined the type of growth stemming from longer or shorter muscle length training. As I frequently discuss, longer muscle length training did consistently cause more muscle growth. We did also see potentially greater longitudinal hypertrophy from longer muscle length training. However, we also saw potentially greater radial hypertrophy from lower muscle length training. In short, training in the stretch position just caused more muscle growth, both longitudinally and radially. Likewise, while some evidence suggests that a muscle can only grow longitudinally in beginners, there are quite a few studies finding longitudinal muscle growth even in lifters and athletes with several years of lifting experience. So even if longer muscle length training primarily worked through longitudinal hypertrophy, advanced lifters still stand to benefit. It does seem like certain types of training cause more longitudinal growth, and certain types of training cause more radial growth. For example, eccentric training can cause more longitudinal growth, whereas concentric training can cause more radial growth. However, the same can't be said for longer muscle length training. Unfortunately, this is an area of research where many influencers jump to conclusions. You see, much of the research is in animals, following unrealistic training protocol. In fact, that's where the term stretch mediated hypertrophy came from. And yet, that concept is being used to describe the results from longer muscle length training in humans, which is a misnomer. These influencers often disregard human randomized controlled trials. For context, this is what the hierarchy of evidence looks like, and where you should get your information from. While future evidence may change this for the time being, simply perform an effective routine based on the human empirical evidence on muscle growth from different training approaches. The reason I don't hammer down on theories and mechanisms more frequently is because they are simply less relevant to the average trainee than a study that directly put two different training approaches to the test and saw which one grew more muscle. That said, these theories have important implications for your training. But I wanna hear from you. Did you know about these five theories? Did you learn anything new? 
leave a comment down below and I'll respond to some of the most upvoted comments.